Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you to Richard and the team at the World Branding Awards. Um, for me, it's a particular honour and a privilege to be in such esteemed company because I really, I've, I've spent my entire personal and professional life being involved in branding. But before I begin, I feel I need to let you into a little bit of a secret. I, I feel I need to be honest because it's quite an intimate evening and I, I, I feel we're all going to get to know each other quite well. I'm actually not an after-dinner speaker. So I'm afraid I've got no jokes up my sleeve. <laughs> Certainly no jokes about the current political status here in the UK. In fact, I actually, I think there might be something wrong with my search engine optimization algorithm on Google because in preparation for today, I, I, I did actually type into Google funny jokes about British politics. Guess what I got back? There's nothing funny about British politics. So that wasn't a very good start. And I'm also, I'm not an after-dinner speaker because I don't do this very often. So I don't have one of those speeches that I just know backwards, that I can deliver and I've got it all nice and smooth and I know when to insert the client name and for it all to go really kind of, you know, just how it should after everyone's had a couple of glasses of wine. I'm also, I'm not a motivational speecher, speaker with an MBE. You know, one of those speakers who comes and tells you about something they've lost, like a limb or their integrity and their dignity, and they then spend the next 10 years trying to soul search and, and find out the journeys of highs and lows that they go through, and they take you through that roller coaster story about themselves and, and what they've learned along the way so that you can take some of that back into your business. And I'm also, I'm not an inspirational speaker because I've never been on a, a big journey or an adventure where I've had a near-death experience, which I then recount to you so that you kind of get emotionally involved with me on everything I've been. And, and again, those highs and lows that I've been through, and it leaves you feeling elated and hopefully inspired. However, I do get up and speak about brands around the world. But normally, I've got a keynote to support me. I've got a nice screen that sits about here. I have lots of fantastic statistics and case studies about brands and some amazing visuals that the, the brands have given me. And if I'm really lucky, some really great videos that tend to make the audience laugh and so keep everyone really engaged throughout my speech. So you'll have to forgive me if tonight I'm relying on my faithful PC to see me through this evening. Because I've written tonight's speech for you and you only. It's never going to be repeated anywhere else. No one else is ever going to hear it. It is exclusive to tonight and you as the people that I'm going to share it with. Does that make you feel a bit special? Does it make you feel a little bit warm and gooey inside? Well, hopefully it does because it's actually what really good brands do, isn't it? That brands at their best make us feel special and make us feel a bit warm and gooey inside because that's what we love about brands. And for as long as I can remember, I have been obsessed about brands. Being a little kid and going into the kitchen and opening up the cupboard and seeing all these tins and these packets opening up the fridge and seeing what was in there, sitting down in front of the television and watching advertising, looking at newspapers and magazines and going to the cinema and seeing the adverts that would show between the main feature, going into shops, of course. I've always been attracted to brands. And then throughout my professional career, I've PR'd brands, I've promoted brands, 
I've marketed brands, I've advertised brands, I've built brands, I've taken brands apart, I've worked on their DNA, their pillars, um, their values, I've created brands from scratch, and I've helped re rebuild brands around the world. But the one thing I've never done is I've never worked for a brand. I've always been what's called agency side. But I've always been insatiably curious about what we consume, how we consume, and why we consume. And for me, what really gets me excited right now, and I think you can probably tell, I'm a glass half full kind of person, not a glass half empty kind of person. I think there's never been a more important time to be thinking about brands. And never has this idea of the who, the what, and the why been more important to consumers, to our industry, but also to society. Because we really are right now at such a transformational period in human history. Now, if we were to do a quick sort of potted history of the growth of brands, most of us will, of course, know that in the last century, the 20th century, the big journey that we went on with brands is that they stopped being about just transaction, things that we needed to buy, where there was a focus on function and the functional quality of a product, where product was really defined as something that you could drop on your foot. It was solid. It was real. You could hold it in your hand. But of course, what we started to see at the latter end of the 20th century was that we became just as interested in brands for the relationship that we as a person, an individual, could have with a brand. That what that brand stood for. And of course, it's where the word brand comes from. It was the emphasis of actually the aspiration that was attached to that brand, of what it suggested about us and how we chose to spend the money that we had. And it was towards the end of the last century, of course, that we started to really evaluate as brand custodians, as brand builders and as brand managers, just how valuable that experience was that our customer would have with our brand. Hence, of course, the book written by uh, um, Joseph B. Pine 17 years ago now, The Experience Economy, where he started to chart this idea that maybe it was actually the experience that was more important to the customer than the brand or the product itself. So let's segue to here we are, the third decade of the 21st century, and we really are in a decade of transformation, the transformational 20s, or if you like, the transformation economy, in which our consumer who has been on this journey of understanding the importance of moving from a relationship on brand based on function to one that's taken them to experience, to this idea that their integral desire now is for brands to transform them, that they're actively, indeed proactively, searching out for the brands, the businesses, the goods, the services, the organisations that can help them on their journey to become healthier, wealthier and happier. As we look to transform ourselves during this period of unprecedented change. So here we are, as I've said, in the third decade of the 21st century. And one of the challenges that all of us in this room face is that we were all born in the 20th century. We are the product of the 20th century. And yet increasingly our consumer is a product of the 21st century. And increasingly more and more of them will be the product of the 21st century. I'll come back to that in a minute. So here we are, 
a decade of unprecedented change, an era of continued social, economic, political and environmental uncertainty and instability. Which is why I think so many of us, when we think about our strategies and our campaigns, are moving beyond traditional models of one-size-fits-all marketing and logo hegemony to become more elastic in the way that we think about our brand, more plastic in how we allow it to develop and morph, and maybe more fantastic in the way that we allow them to operate, prepared to morph and change with the simultaneous desires of our 21st century consumer, a desire for brands that contains what we call the four C's of branding. Community, creativity, collaboration, and conversation. Now, all of these attributes require brands to do some very important things to listen to our customers, to lean in to their worlds and what's important to them. And dare I say it, to lead, to have an opinion, a perspective, a point of view with a sense of legitimacy, legacy and liability especially if we are to survive in a climate that I'm sure we can all recognize is increasingly uncertain and within a consumer ecosystem that is increasingly unforgiving. A few statistics for you, even though I haven't got my PowerPoint screen behind me. Now, according to Forrester research, 42% of our Gen Z say that they do not trust the average American company. According to Kantar, only 14% of people trust advertisers when gathering information about a business. And according to Edelman, the world's largest PR company, nearly two thirds of us are seeing more trust washing from brands. So that isn't exactly working in our favor as an industry, is it? And for brands then, I think operating within these quixotic times, it isn't really anymore about survival of the biggest. And I think you can ask Martin Sorrell about this. It's about survival of the fittest and the most flexible. But it's also about the survival and the emergence of, I think, the most purposeful. As brands, we can no longer divorce ourselves from the responsibility of our actions that we take as brand custodians. That's part of that L for liability that I mentioned. Or can we see purpose as a byproduct of profit rather than the other way round? Now, as James Perry, who is the co-founder of the UK's B Corp movement, recently told me at the Future Laboratory, the imperative to change the orientation of all business is now desperately urgent. By changing its purpose to create value for everyone, people and planet alongside shareholders, business and brands can regenerate and renew become part of the solution, a force for good, rather than the cause of the problem and a force for bad. It's a nice sentiment, isn't it? And it's probably one that I share, or that he, James Perry, shares with many of us in this room. But if only it were that simple, because the trouble is right now, there's a bigger story at play than just this one thorny issue to try and resolve or get our heads around. There are so many complex and interwoven narratives or drivers that are going on right now that when you're so close to the eye of the storm, it can at times be very difficult to see the way forward in this uncertain time of unpredictability. So I'd like to offer you some help by turning these drivers into a set of questions for you 
to ask yourself as a professional, but also to ask as the manager, the owner, the custodian of the brand that you represent here today. I mentioned earlier this difference between being a room full of people who are the product of the 20th century in a world where increasingly our customer is of the 21st century. So my first question would be, are 20th century brands fit for purpose in the 21st century? We like to believe in the world of branding that we can live forever. Have you ever looked at that list to find out how many brands make it beyond the age of 75? How many brands actually are there that are still around after 100 years? How do we be fit for purpose for this new century? What do we need to do? Here's another question for you. Are the branding metrics and the mechanics that powered success over the last 50 years still relevant? What about this? What does the 21st century consumer want from their brands in this era of unpredictability and the new extraordinary? Or finally, is it possible to move our revenue goals from tangible product and continued quantitative growth to intangible product and post-purpose profit? That's a tough one. Can we learn to make money, not from the brand that sits at the center of our offer, but from all of the peripherals that surround our brand? That's increasingly what we're seeing in that new wild west that's called the metaverse. But that's another speech for another day. Now, fundamental to this, I think, is the need to change our definition, not of ourselves and our brands, but of consumers themselves. From a descriptor that sadly, historically, is often passive or even dismissive, to a future definition that is more proactive and participatory and therefore elastic. Now, one of the new books that I've got by my bedside, which I'm thoroughly enjoying, is called Citizens. And as John Alexander and Ariane Conrad, its co-authors, believe, this is all about seeing people, consumers, as citizens rather than, rather than subjects or consumers. And with this identity, they say, it becomes easier to see that all of us are smarter than any of us. And that the strategy for navigating the difficult times ahead is to tap into the diverse ideas, the energy and the resources of everyone. Diversity, as the author and broadcaster Matthew Syed explains, doesn't just drive value, it uplifts innovation and increases our ability to flex and to change. But if these future citizens, not consumers, call on us to be more diverse and inclusive, as all of our recent research indicates, they also want brands, us, to be more truthful, more transparent, and more trustworthy. Not trustworthy, but trustworthy. See, I knew if I tried a political joke, it wouldn't work. But, and this is a big but, this has to be something that we do both externally and internally as well. We cannot be what you could call a Janus brand a brand with two faces. Instead, we must be one that presents the same face internally and externally. So if we talk about truth and transparency as a core external value, we need to have the same values and frameworks reflected within our organizations. And this is why in a recent survey we did, 
86% of C-suite executives that we polled believe that their companies will in the future hire a chief trust officer, while 88% are looking forward to welcoming a head of betterment to ensure long-term change within their organisations. We're also going to need to consider how we make these citizens of tomorrow a core part of our communities, a core part of our collaborative innovation networks, and a core part of our corporate structure. You know, just weeks on from the news announcement that the founder of Patagonia, the clothing business, Yvonne Chouinard, was giving away his business to make planet Earth its only shareholder, beauty brand Faith in Nature has announced Nature, with a capital N, is being given a company director role at the organisation. Building on the eco-focused brand's internal mantra that Nature is the boss, Faith in Nature has spent the last 18 months seeing if it can become a reality and that they can be the first global business that has a whole new governance system that allows a non-human entity, Mother Nature, to be represented on their board by a responsible human who is legally bound to speak on behalf of the natural world at every single one of their board meetings. Could you imagine that on your board? Having Mother Nature sit on your board with potentially the deciding or carrying vote in everything you're trying to do? Now for me, that's an excellent example of liability in action being accountable and taking ownership of existential crises, acknowledging uncertainty and being transparent in the challenges that we all face ahead. So for me, this is a chance for brands to pilot a transformative future for business. So what are we going to need to do? Well, I think the first thing that we've got to get better at is letting our customer in to see what goes on internally in our organisations. Taking the lid off the can, opening up the bonnet and showing the inner workings of our brand. Something that probably makes some of us quite uncomfortable. I think we also need to embrace new business models. 21st century thinking for 21st century consumers with a 21st century mindset. We're going to have to get better at thinking about speed to opportunity. Just because we've done it once doesn't mean it's going to keep being successful. Build it and they will come is no longer a successful business mantra in the 21st century. Instead, we need to be focusing on words like decentralization, how we flatten the hierarchical structures in our organizations, how we become more networked, democratic, and federated, and how we really learn to embrace disintermediation. Such a great word. It's going to be all about how much we can flux and flex, how much we're prepared to change, to be elastic, to embrace plasticity, to be fantastic, to think about the opportunities in intangible trading. New business horizons, new roles, new categories, new relationships. So just to finish, a reminder of those four C's of good branding. Community, creativity, collaboration, and conversation. So can you, dare you, think about how you can collaborate 
with your competitor on common goals. Because in the decade ahead, in the fight for survival, smart brands know that working together beats operating in isolation. So are you prepared to put traditional rivalries and hierarchies aside and look for progressive growth opportunities through mutually beneficial partnerships with those who strive towards common goals? Could you imagine working with your closest competitor for a more profitable future? Can you get creative about how to reevaluate and repurpose resources? we're going to have to be willing to transform the very foundations that our businesses were built on. From products to places to people, we're going to have to reevaluate the roles that these assets play in our business future by reviewing them in the context of the challenges that we all face ahead. And the best way we can do that is to take steps now to repurpose or recalibrate, not to wait for the eventuality of what confronts us in the future. Challenge equals change. Change equals opportunity. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I think there's a brave new world ahead, but one that we need to prepare for if we are to successfully surf the ongoing uncertainty that brands continue to face as climate, dwindling resources, increased political and ideological challenges continue, so should we, as future-faced brands, be hoping for an end to the cost of living crisis and the beginning of the cost of living differently challenge and make that a legacy project. Thank you very much.